Hello, and welcome back to my reviews of Doctor Who Flux. I, I know it's been a long time, it's been a huge wait, I understand, I'm sorry, it's just... I really don't want to say something stupid when I finally decide to sit down and conduct this review. You know, the deeper and deeper we get into the season, the bigger and bigger these episodes get, the more and more threads we're following, the more and more I have to put a filter over what I say because there's a lot banking on what I say here. Not that there's any censorship going on, I'm going to say what I want to say, but you know. I have to think about it. Here we are. The penultimate episode of Doctor Who Flux. A five episode journey to this point. We had a ton of threads to follow in this episode, a ton of plot points, new characters, characters interacting, story beats happening, all leading up to episode six, The Vanquishers, the season finale. I don't really pride myself in being a Chibnall hater. I really tried to give these episodes in Flux a fair shake, to look at them objectively, to sit down, watch the episode, conduct notes on it, and try my best to just see the episode warts and all, you know, the bright spots included. The point of going through these episodes, taking note of every single thing, talking about it is so that, you know, we don't forget the good stuff, and we also don't forget the bad stuff, which I think a lot of people are doing. Doctor Who Flux is a season of Doctor Who built on a lot of potential success. You know, we have mysteries, we have character arcs, we have things building up to something. But that doesn't particularly mean that the journey is executed well. But anyway, let's get into it already. Survivors of the Flux, Episode 5. I again recorded my reaction to this one, my initial reaction. Uh, I was a bit more lively in this one than the Episode 4 one, so I had a lot more material, you know, to work with and make jokes off of. I think this will be a much more energetic review of Doctor Who Flux. You know, this was a bigger episode, it was bolder, it was grander, there was a story happening and exciting stuff going on. Survivors of the Flux, the penultimate episode of Doctor Who Flux. The cliffhanger that ends this one is either going to be the dumbest thing in the history of forever, or maybe kind of good. Uh, I am so terrified of what I'm going to see. But yeah, let's get into it already. Episode 5, Survivors of the Flux, the penultimate episode of Doctor Who Flux. We get a big old recap recounting episode 4 mainly, as well as 3, 2, and 1, and how that is relevant to episode 5, you know, regarding the division, you know, Swarm, Azure, Bell, Vendor, all that nice stuff, all these crazy characters uh, that we've established throughout Flux, all of it coming to a head in this episode. Fuck. I'm so scared. God, my voice feels shredded already. But yeah, we don't actually get a cold open scene for this one. It's just the previously trailer. You know, we've had previously trailers for every single episode in Flux. For this one, we don't have a cold open scene. It's just a big previously trailer and then the title card, which, you know, that's fine. God, no. Fuck, this is it. Oh, man. I'm so terrified. Jesus. The nerves right now. And all this shit on social media with like, no spoilers, don't spoil fucking Survivors of the Flux. Oh, I hope he doesn't do anything stupid. Please, Chris. Uh, following the title card, we uh, see Jodie Whittaker, where we left her off. You know, being transformed into Weeping Angel. We cut from the title card. It's a shot of, you know, Weeping Angel hands. We are assuming this is Jodie Whittaker, the Weeping Angel's hands. Written by Chris Chibnall. Jodie Whittaker Angel, because, you know, why wouldn't it be? So we pan out, it is Jodie Whittaker, the Weeping Angel. Uh, she's encased in stone, we're sitting there going, right, she's a Weeping Angel, how the fuck are they going to get out of this one? And then uh, in a great big CG shot, all the stone just kind of crumbles away, and we have Jodie Whittaker, the Doctor, you know, just kind of walking around in this big, foggy area of Weeping Angels. What the hell is this? What am I looking at? Well... That was a cliffhanger. What the hell am I looking at? So it's at this point that we realize that Jodie Whittaker was never really turned into a Weeping Angel. It was just kind of a transitionary thing for the Weeping Angels to transport her some, like to this big division Weeping Angels place where there's a ton and they're just kind of talking to her. Say something. This extraction squad for the division. Fucking like stupid. Uh, Weeping Angels are talking. Uh, but we get a big dialogue scene where the angels are talking to the, well, the angel, the spokesperson for the angels is talking to the doctor telepathically. 
where they just kind of talk about how they're with the division and what the doctor where she is and you know why she should be afraid of them or something and the doctor is very you know aggressive and confrontational with these angels because she wants to save her friends and then the angels are like your friends are doomed or something and then the doctor says my friends are never in danger and then we cut away to 1904 mexico 1904 mexico what hello what fuck is that jericho did i just hear my boy jericho yes this is my biggest problem with this episode, right out the gates. So, if we remember the cliffhanger that ended episode 4, of how Dan, Yaz, and Jericho, and oh, I forgot her name, Peggy, are trapped in 1904, I believe is the, it would make sense if this is in 1904. Uh, but they're trapped in the past, they have no way out of this village, because we remember, it is quantum extracted. The damn thing is suspended in time. You can't leave. And that was the whole crux of the finale. Like, they can't go anywhere. They're trapped here in the past. You know, no TARDIS, no time travel, no transportation or anything. And the Doctor has turned into a weeping angel. Here we have, you know, Jericho, Yaz, and Dan in Mexico going on Indiana Jones fucking adventures. With no explanation as to how the hell they got out of that quantum extraction. I, I guess I'm supposed to assume that it was lifted as soon as, you know, the scene ended. But it bothered me, as much as, you know, all of the unexplained stuff in Doctor Who Flux has bothered me so far. This one probably the most. You know, we cut away from this cliffhanger, similar to, you know, the first one, episode one, where the, the cliffhanger for episode one is the Flux eating the TARDIS. And then in episode two, we're just on the battlefield during the Crimean War. You know, no explanation as to how they got out of that. No explanation as to why the TARDIS is here and functional. You know, it happens off screen and I, I don't like that because it's impossible for me to... I mean, it's a Doctor Who cliffhanger, so who really cares? But at the same time, I'm supposed to believe they're, you know, traveling the world on fucking adventures together. It's so kind of distant from what the hell is going on in the rest of the episode. But yeah, for this episode, we have Jericho. I do like Jericho. I like that he's you know, a new addition to this whole team and that he's running around with Dan and Yaz and he's kind of adopted, you know, being a part of this TARDIS team. I think he is an extremely worthy addition. I love him the most out of any new character in Flux so far, you know, aside from Belle and Vinder, I guess. Vinder especially. I don't think I liked him as much in this episode as I did in Village of the Angels, but he's still, you know, delightfully posh. And, you know, he's just got the sophistication to his language that I just fucking love. He's so much fun. This man is the New River Song. Jericho. So funny that this man is a companion for some reason. Yeah, we cut to 1904 Mexico, where Dan, Yaz, and Jericho are rappelling into this big Mexican tomb where there are, you know, spike traps and stuff. And it's all very silly and, you know, slapsticky in that Doctor Who way. And they're looking for this big MacGuffin in this tomb that is going to help them somehow. It's a very short scene establishing that Yaz, Dan, and Jericho are just kind of operating on their own. Uh, we cut away as soon as Yaz picks up this MacGuffin thingy. I don't know if how they got out of the quantum extraction is going to be explained in episode 6. I highly fucking doubt it. But you know, I, I have to account for that. Maybe we'll get an answer to that. Maybe we'll get an answer as to why this MacGuffin was in this Mexican tomb. Maybe not. Who the hell knows. Uh, and then we cut back to the doctor in this weeping angel place. So, I got no idea right now. Uh, she's in this scene for a very short while until she gets uh, teleported by the weeping angels to... Um, Somewhere, we don't know where yet. Uh, we see an Ood, and I had a comment about the Ood. Ood! Oh. <laughs> Jinx. No! They changed the voice! Oh, what a shit new voice. It sounds like the host from Voyage of the Damned. Oh, that is cringe, Chris Chibnall. You have fucked up for the final time. She is waiting. God. Dude, why does he sound like a robot? Do not remove your conversion plate. Listen to this shit, it's a robot. Follow me. She is waiting. She is waiting. Ooh, don't talk like that, bro. The doctor shares some dialogue with this Ood. Until the scene advances and we get introduced to this old lady character from Once Upon Time. If you remember, 
she was in one scene in Once Upon a Time. It was just a weird random thing where the doctor teleported to this area. And this old lady had a very short exchange with the doctor where she says that the universe is over and she is responsible for the flux. And uh, basically we knew nothing about her when she did pop up here. This is our second time seeing her. She does get established later in this episode to be someone that we should care about. And there's a whole thing that is going to be unraveled through these scenes. But right now we don't know who she is. Other than that, she is important and has information that the doctor does not know about. Hey, it's... It's what's her face. What the hell is happening? I don't even have enough time to take notes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, old lady. This lady's like God or something. Uh, the dialogue in this scene continues. The doctor is asking who she is, why she knows what she knows. Uh, and then, you know, the dialogue progresses and we find out that she, this person, is associated with division. The scenes with this doctor and old lady just mesh in my brain after a while. I think it's in the scene where we get the reveal that uh, Division is simply, you know, experimenting with the idea of existing out of the universe and that they have some sort of connection with Time Lord Society or Gallifreyan Society. Yeah, whatever you want to think of it as. Uh, and that they're pretty much bad news. We don't like it. The division is sketch. It's weird. We don't really care for it. The doctor certainly doesn't like it. You know, the division is associated with the whole timeless child stuff and her previous lives and how she cares about how all that shit was redacted from her memory. But here, this grandma character simply says that where they are located is the division headquarters and she is associated with division and we're going to find out more about that in the ensuing scenes Doctor. welcome back Boom. Uh, and then we're back with jericho and the crew in 1904 constantinople again with this chris chibnall thing everyone is everywhere mexico constantinople what the hell is it why does he always do this where they are in Constantinople talking about their mission and how they've been doing this for a few years and they're trying to get the MacGuffin and save the universe. Clearly I missed like a mini-sode or something because I don't understand how the hell they got out of the con- it's pissing me off more and more than I think about it. How the hell did they get out of that? And why are they traveling across the world? How do they know about any of this? It doesn't make any sense. I feel like I've said that so many times throughout Doctor Who Flux. You know, I'm just expected to roll with the fact that we have no answers at all. I did not love this companion stuff in this episode because it was so baseless. Uh, there was nothing... I mean, I, I understood that they're, you know, they're trying to save the universe get back to the present day, find the doctor. I know all that stuff. How they have that information and how they got to where they are in the plot ensuing now. Completely in the dark. Like, as in the dark as you can possibly imagine it. I don't know, man. What? My boy Jerica. But yeah, that's our scene in Constantinople. Pretty much just exists to have dialogue where Dan says that They've been in this time period for two years now, and they've been doing this. Um, someone plants some dynamite in Constantinople. They run out, and we get a smash cut to a boat, like a big boat. So the companions are on a big boat. If they're in this boat multiple times in the episode. This big Titanic-ass boat. Now it's the Titanic. I don't think they own the boat, but at the same time, if they do own the boat, why do they own a boat? Why was this not explained at all? Why are they on a boat? Why do they continue to be on a boat? I'm just supposed to roll with the fact that our companions have a boat, or they're just able to get on boats without anyone noticing multiple times. It's just so weird, man. So they're on a boat. A giant, like, yacht cruise ship boat. They're in their cabin, and they're talking, and then a waiter comes in, and they get into a big fight scene where uh, he bites his finger and then dies and yes says no whoa better not hit my boy jericho what he bit his finger i was very confused there until they explained it five seconds later hello poison capsule oh self-sacrifice eh 
poisoning. Jolly good thing too. I was just about to. Uh, what is happening, dude? What happened to the quantum entrapment thing from Village of the Angels, where they couldn't leave? Cause it was just how the hell did they get out of that, dude? So a really weird action scene that didn't make. I don't understand why this person is attacking them. I don't know why they're on the run or what even the hell is going on with that. Just I'm uh, clearly I missed something, and I was paying very close attention, as you can see from the fucking reaction. I can't have possibly missed the establishing scene where they talk about, oh yeah, also there are people that are attacking us, and they bite their fingers and kill themselves with poison capsules. I don't know what else to say about it. It just made no sense. All of this shit, may, it's not set up at all. Uh, we just kind of have to get past that and then get to the later stuff. So he cut away to uh, 1958 England. We're doing the same, you know, the Spyfall Praxis, Can You Hear Me stuff, where we're just, you know, across the world. We're in six different continents following all sorts of other people. 1958. Uh, here we get uh, this uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Look, he does not look a single iota like Benedict Cumberbatch. He's just, that's just the name he has been cursed with because I just, I see him and I always think of, you know, Once Upon a Time and me going, is that Benedict Cumberbatch? He looks nothing like him. I'm just, that's the name I'm calling him. I know he's called the Grand Serpent or whatever. But yeah, this is the guy from Vinder's Past. We don't understand why he's here. Uh, or any of that going forward. We don't know what race he is. We don't know what race Vinder is on top of that. But he's here and coercing with this human person where they're just kind of chatting up and getting to know each other. We find out later that this is the founding of Unit that we're watching. And we're seeing the history of Unit in this episode. Okay. Uh, but basically this whole Benedict Cumberbatch guy plot point is to establish that he has been, you know, involved in the Roots of Unit for a long time, and he's been planting bad seeds, and, uh, you know, rising up in the ranks and, and, and killing people, because he's a bad guy. Yeah, that's that scene. And we cut away to, uh, again, Yaz in this cabin. This fucking boat. Uh, we see this whole hologram. This is the Mag I'm pretty sure this is the MacGuffin from the Mexican cave, but it's a hologram of Jody Whittaker, expositing about what Yaz and crew need to do. I can don't know how she knew that was there, why any of it is important, you know, it's 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 nothing to me. It's this whole big emotional moment where Yaz is, you know, it's a hol it's this they're doing it's just like the parting of the ways. In Chris Chibnall's mind, this is his do that for me, Rose. Have a fantastic life moment. When it is just not. You know, nothing of this was set up. It's just the hologram where Jody says, there's trouble. And you gotta figure it out, Yaz. And Yaz is, I wish you were here, Doctor. Having just left the planet time. We should Fucking this. planet time. Still, this will activate two weeks after we've not had contact with each other. Why? Where it pulls through time. It will have been foreseen somewhere. <sighs> I hate this so much. It's just an invention. It's hard for me to connect with it at all. It's an invention. These emotional beats are too infrequent, too ham-fisted, too driven into scenes so blatantly to have a character moment with no setup or finesse. Or I mean, there is finesse to the dialogue, I guess, where, yeah, she just kind of is silent and, you know, doesn't show her sadness. But... There's nothing of me to care about that because the characters are given so little intimate connection. They haven't been shown, you know, they, they get on well enough, but there's no emotional through line like with Belle and Vinder. Whereas with the Yaz stuff, it's a doctor and companion dynamic at its most fucking fundamental level. And it's especially bad when Dan walks in and talks about how, you know, we'll get back because he literally just showed up out of nowhere. You know, he got dragged into this thing in episode one, and he's just kind of here. I enjoy Dan enough, but there's even less of an emotional connection with Dan as a character. You know, I, I feel like I understand almost nothing about him that wasn't explored in his establishing scenes in episode one. He's just kind of been around in the background and been a character, a companion in flux as opposed to a character. I have huge gripes with these characters. I have had huge gripes with these characters in my previous Flux reviews. It is a problem that has not gone away. 
I don't see how people think it has gone away because it has so clearly not gone away. It's a cog in the plot. It's so obvious. There's no finesse. But it's a perfect scene to kind of focus on. The emotional moments of Doctor Who Flux that Chibnall has just made it so impossible for me to connect with. And then we're back with the Doctor and the Division Lady, and I'm going to let my reaction play here because there's a lot of stuff that gets set up and revealed in this ensuing dialogue. Just take it away, me. Multiverses. Our terminology became quaint a long time ago. Multiverses. So here we are, Doctor Who, what the fuck are you doing? Conversion place allow us to exist in form outside the known universe. Very good. You always were fast at processing everything. Hey, hang on, what? It allow us to exist in form outside the known universe. Very good. That doesn't make any fucking sense. I've never heard the word conversion plate in my life. Okay, so the thing with this division stuff is, as a plot point for, I'm a, this is a sector of the Time Lords. This is a thing that the Time Lords would do. This whole division thing where it's like an organization trying to i think that i mean as of right now i think it is that their whole motive is to find multiverses and get out of this universe and expand and then they have operatives and shit i don't love that the weeping angels are part of it literally pick any other villain besides the weeping angels you know they can communicate telepathically but it's the whole fundamental problem is that Weeping Angels do not have an agenda. They do not work for anyone. They have no desire to, you know, create alliances. It's not within their motives. The Division as a concept, I think, is totally fine. Because the Time Lords, you know, they would do that. They're scummy people. And the Doctor, written right here, makes sense that she's, uh, you know, outraged about that. I'm very afraid of what they're going to do with Timeless Child and the Timeless Doctors with the Division. I don't think it can get worse than the Timeless Child, but, you know, never say never, so. It's over, Doctor. It has been ever since we let a virus into the experiment. It's not a virus. Virus. You, you God. From the vision, and you couldn't leave the universe alone. <laughs> yeah, I blame myself a little, but mostly I blame you. Oh my You're God. Uh, I suppose I can interject here and say that I misinterpret the dialogue in this scene just a little bit too much, which honestly just puts the onus on Chris Chibnall for the fact that I even believed that he would do something like this. But yeah, when the scene continues, I amend my thoughts in a big conclusive review on the reveals of that scene. But my initial reaction, this is what I thought Chris Chibnall was alluding to. Oh my god. Holy fucking shit. I had no words. So... <sighs> the Doctor... The Doctor, the Timeless Child, as we learned back in episode 10 of my favorite series of Doctor Who series 12, the Doctor is the Timeless Child. It is... She is the catalyst for regeneration. She is the source of it. And she can regenerate an infinite amount of time. So she's how... Time Lords got regeneration. There are lives past to the first Doctor that we don't know about. And there's whole implications to that. Dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. Everybody hated it. Here we are. <sighs> Series 13, Episode 5, Survivors of the Flux. Where the Doctor originated as a virus in a lab from the Division that got out, spread the Flux, and also is the Timeless... Is your flawed. Who even are you? You don't remember. Fuck. Don't do it. <sighs> Why would you? I think my eyes are the same even across the regeneration. No, dude. But you wouldn't know. No, dude. Stop. Count me. Oh, God. I'm the one who found you. Oh, this is Texian. I brought you to Gallifrey. Okay, not, not, not her mom. The woman you used to call mother. Oh, okay, well, I guess that's the same thing. Okay, so we've learned more about this. The Doctor is not the Flux, because that would be just completely fucking stupid, so I was wrong there. The Doctor is the Timeless Child. All of that is still the same. The Doctor broke out of the Division. 
or the division created from Gallifrey and society. This is Texeun that we know. So Texeun founded the division, obviously performed experiments on the Doctor as we know her, and the Timeless Child stuff played out. But the Flux was created by the Division because they were scared of the Doctor. I was scared there for a second. You guys saw me. I thought, I thought, I, that was genuine fear. Basically, this whole Division thing, and it wasn't really explained that these are the uber duber bad guys of Flux that we're supposed to be, you know, rooting against. I mean, I guess it was motivation enough to hate them that they stole the Doctor's memories. I guess, but yeah, these are the bad guys of Flux, pretty much, aside from Swarm and Azir. Basically, it's just a organization of all these uh, alien races uh, conglomerating around the, you know, Time Lords. I believe it's led by the Time Lords uh, almost exclusively, but, you know, they have agents, division agents or whatever, you know, with the Weeping Angels. Um, basically, it's an organization that... Uh, just kind of meddle with time. They're basically just a bunch of dicks, and they go around messing around with stuff and being just, you know, bad guys for the sake of it, of course. Uh, a cool idea, I guess, this whole rogue Time Lord society uh, came out of nowhere, naturally, with Flux. And what the Doctor is doing throughout Flux, getting information on the Division, trying to figure out more about what her past is, because she doesn't know, obviously, after the reveal of the Timeless Child and what the hell that meant in the Timeless Child from the Master through the whole Matrix thing. Uh, again, not to clarify, dumbest idea ever. I will die on this hill. It is the dumbest thing to ever happen. Anyway, uh, here we're basically getting that the Division know that the Doctor is trying to figure out more about them. So they created the Flux, which is what has killed the system, in order to try and kill the Doctor, I think. And then they're going to evacuate to a new universe. Honestly, as overarching narratives go, I think Division, solid idea. I really wish it was explained better in the actual episode in this whole scene. Because I was confused out of my mind. I had to literally look it up afterwards. But I think Division is a cool idea. This rogue Time Lord agency that's pretty much just bad Time Lords. I don't love that Weeping Angels are involved in it because it's just so stupid. Weeping Angels are Weeping Angels. They don't get involved in politics or agencies or cults or whatever, especially to do with Time Lords. It doesn't make any sense. But I think Division, as an idea, is cool. I think they're a pretty good enough villain. I think Tech Taeyun is a decent enough spokesperson for these bad guys. I think there is cause enough to hate them. I just don't love that it's rooted in timeless child i am petrified to see where russell t davies is forced to take this i hope to god he retcons it you know i have a lot of respect for russell t davies i think he's a fantastic writer and even if we don't retcon timeless child in his series i think he can tweak it and rewrite it to make it good because he's just that talented of a damn writer uh, but Division is cool. I definitely got way too up in arms way too quickly about the Division reveal. I thought Chris Chibnall was just gonna go out the window with his plot, but he actually, you know, this is, it's cool. Division is cool. This is a grounded enough plot for Flux. I think it has come around very well. I think where this gets resolved in the Vanquishers could result in a pretty good Doctor Who series in terms of serialization. In terms of the execution, I don't think it was that much of an improvement from the rest of Chibnall. Case in point, the entire B-plot of this episode involving Cherico, Yaz, and Dan. This whole plot that came out of nowhere where they're, <laughs> they're traveling the world. But yeah, that's my more conclusive thoughts on this whole division thing. It's uh, it's decent enough, I suppose. Uh, and then we cut away to uh, <laughs> the uh, dog, the Lupari. They're called Lupari. Uh, they're, you know, big spaceship shield around Earth from episode one. Forgot this was happening because we cut away so quickly after episode one to go follow, you know, all the crazy shit that Flux did after this. But we're back. I'm liking this because... Honestly, forgotten about all this from episode one. We've been in the past for so long. Where the Lupari spacecrafts are shielding the Earth, we see Dogman, uh, and he's talking to a you know rogue Lupari spaceship that has 
jettison from the formation so there is now a uh you know a, a, a breaching point on the earth's defenses from the lupari spacecraft uh, we find out later that bell is the one piloting this rogue spacecraft and that's why it jettisoned Bell. jesus everyone is in this episode honestly not surprising it's it's getting hard for me to follow these things uh and these characters are about to interact uh bell has basically jettisoned to go try and find azure because she's uh she's got a she's got a vendetta against them because of what she saw back in village of the angels and then Dogman gets on the intercom for uh, Bell's Lufari spacecraft, and they get into a big old argument where, uh, you know, they have a good exchange. This is nice. I was excited to see Bell and Dogman interact. It was cool. Ah, uh, this is... This is their Death Star. Oh, shit! I forgot about that, Lufari. So Bell's been here the whole time. I didn't know that. Totally you forgot that. Don't you dare hyperjack me. Oh, I'm Dogman. Weird. Uh, and then we cut away to Vendor. So we're getting a lot of cuts in this one where we're transitioning between Yaz, Doctor, and Jericho, Doctor and Grandma, Dogman and Bell, Vendor, Swarm and Azir, all this stuff. It's kind of getting, we're just getting a ton of, you know, boop, 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 and also Benedict Cumberbatch, man. Uh, yeah, we're getting a lot of cuts like that. Uh, and specifically here with this whole space odyssey between Bell, Dogman, and Vinder, these characters are kind of having their own adventure. Uh, but Vinder is just kind of teleporting around. Uh, he's actually at Swarm and Azure's kind of home base evil Death Star thing, uh, where we see all the people that were teleported from Village of the Angels back with on... I forget the, I forget the planet's name. But yeah, back there when Azure teleported all of them to what she claimed to be a new unharmed universe this is what we figure out is a prison where they're being used as fuel for time uh we see them all disintegrate you know reality bomb style oh, bender shit dude fuck man missing people something something oh so this is the prison gotcha swarming azure my favorite villains in the entire world, next to the Pating. You are space, and we are time. See, this shit pisses me off, because it makes no sense. Swarm delivers more of his weird, tenant techno babble inspired lines that make no sense. Can you feel the time force growing? It's working. The fucking time Just force. Uh, and then we're back with the Doctor and Tech Tayun, where we're learning more about the division. If I have a noteworthy clip to play from here. I'll play it now. Uh, then we come back to 1967 England with Benedict Cumberbatch and his, you know, unit friend, which is, you know, a whole nine years from 1958, where we saw the birth of unit. Uh, so basically in this scene, we figure out that uh, the Grand Serpent is a big old bad guy, and he kills this guy that he's been buddies with for 10 years with his weird back snake. Uh, but yeah, we see that unit is getting started. They have their whole detecting uh, alien technology. He puts it up to the Grand Serpent's face. He reads as alien. The guy doesn't realize that he's an alien at first, and then he gets killed by his weird CGI uh, snake. I prefer to be called no Grand Serpent. Okay, thought he was gonna say the Master. So yeah, more of these just kind of tiny cuts of this Grand Serpent guy going around and uh, killing people throughout the history of UNIT for some reason. I'm assuming it's gonna factor into episode six, so, you know. Uh, and then we cut back to the Doctor and uh, Tech Seyun where we get a perfect opportunity for Chibnall to possibly erase Timeless Child. So, is what the Master told me true? <sighs> Say it's fake! And Chibnall, of course, does the unthinkable. Ooh. Yeah. God damn it, Triss, you had an opportunity. I found you. A lost child alone. Beneath a monument. No Come on, Chris. Seemingly deposited there. But Nobody wanted this. And then we cut back to Vinder where he gets confronted by Swarm and his big bodyguard uh guy. And uh he gets teleported to this weird astral plane where where his spirit is just kind of hanging out 
Uh, we see Diane is in there from, you know, uh, Dan's love interest. Sure you could. I wonder if Swarm is going to kill Vendor with his mind. They are so tiny. Oh, he actually did. No, no, he didn't. Finally, someone with a gun. I'm dying. Why the fuck didn't he kill him? <laughs> if he can If he can disintegrate people with his mind, why did he teleport him here where they can escape? Which is inevitably what the fuck is gonna happen. Obviously, Vidner and Diane are gonna get out of this time dungeon that they're in. Again, we have to ask if this guy can melt people with his mind. Why didn't he just kill Vinder instead of putting him in this place that he is inevitably going to escape from? Because fucking of course. So I, it's just a thing for me. It's just every single time I see this guy, I'm like, well, you don't even need to touch people to kill them. You just do it with your fucking mind. Kill him if you want him to not, you know, be a problem. Doesn't make any sense. And now we're back with uh, Jericho and Dan and Yaz in 1904 Nepal. Great. Nepal. Where they're still traveling the world, trying to find those super duper MacGuffins to get them back to their time. Uh, they're climbing a mountain on a big old hike to find a hermit, where uh, Chris Chibnall tries to write a funny character. I'm watching you for days. You need to take more exercise. So, what's the gossip? <laughs> down there. This is funny. No, it's not funny, Chris. It's such a painfully unfunny moment. It reminds me so much of the comedy that Chris Shimmel has written in his other episodes of Doctor Who. It's just awful. I can't see anyone thinking that this character was funny in any way. The word cringe is such a buzzword in this day and age, but I think there's no more fitting word for what the scene was. It was so unbearably cringe. Uh, but we get this whole hermit character uh, who is basically going to give them some big sage advice on how to get back to their time. And he gives them three words. Those three words are... We've climbed all this way for three words. Go on. Doctor Who. Oh, me, their souls. Your souls. Dog. Remarkably similar. So yeah, this very clearly alludes to Dogman, who we've already seen in the episode, so we know he's going to factor in a little bit here. Uh, so we're in 1904 at the Great Wall of China. So we're in China now. Uh, we see Dan with a beard, which was exciting, and Jericho with a beard, which was also exciting. Uh, and they're painting a big sign which says, uh, uh, Carvanista, which is Dogman's name, Dan is here in 1904 or something, come get me. Uh, it's a big painted message around the Great Wall of China, and Dogman sees this and remarks on how the fact that he doesn't have time travel and that... You know, Dan is annoying and unhelpful. Uh, I don't think I actually took note of the scene where Belle and Dogman interact. Is it? I mean, I'm, it might be later. I think I might have missed it. But, uh, yeah, Dogman and Belle, uh, Dogman boards Belle's spaceship and they have a big old scuffle. And then eventually just kind of become allies because, of course. But it was a good scene, I guess. Uh, but then we're back with the Doctor who is kind of just hanging out on Division's home base now. Uh, the Ood is watching over her so she can't get away. Uh, but we get a nice scene where uh, the Doctor is bargaining with the Ood to kind of just let her go. And obviously we saw this coming because the Ood are, you know, historically nice aliens for the most part, unless they're being controlled by Satan or controlled by an evil brain or controlled by a malevolent planet. But in this scene... The doctor is bargaining with the Ood. She's saying that, uh, you know, in this universe that the Division are killing, uh, there are a ton of his species that are getting killed naturally in the whole chaos that's ensuing. And uh, she's kind of appealing to his pathos and his empathy to just kind of let her be free so that she can save them or give her the intel that she needs to, to save them and get free. I'm not one. You cannot. It is too late. It's never too late. I'm very good at pulling rabbits out of hats. I have no rabbits. It's a metaphor. Honestly, it doesn't matter. This is a good sure. scene. Uh, it's a nice scene. I think the doctor has written very well in the scene where she sh shows her compassion. Uh, the Ood, this was a very touching moment. The Ood are historically pretty moving uh, and sympathetic aliens. I think it was a nice scene. You know, it there was some fun dialogue here. I think the doctor was nice and, you know, 
that connection was there. I, th- I think this is what an anomaly in regards to Chris Chibnall and his doctor written scenes. It doesn't feel like it was written by him at all, and it was very good. Uh, but the Ood gives away um, a map of the system or something uh, and says that the Earth is going to be like the, I guess, like ground zero of flux or something. Basically, it means that the Earth is going to die and they need to save it or something. That's basically what I took away from that line. I'm not sure if that's what it actually meant. But uh, yeah, we get that and we get a whole map of the system. We see that everything's fucked up. Uh, and then we see a very familiar prop. What is that noise? That whispering. I cannot hear it. It's coming from over here. How can you not hear that? What the hell is... Excuse me? Chibnall? What the hell are you doing? It's the fob watch from Human Nature, Family of Blood, and Utopia. Which, you know, stores Time Lord Consciousness. So, it is here that we figure out that that pocket watch is holding all of the Doctor's memories. And that she need this is her big ol' MacGuffin for the whole of Flux. This is the only thing she's cared about for the entire run of this goddamn series. All she wants is that pocket watch filled with her memories. Uh, Tecteon foolishly says that, yep, we store all your memories in there. Don't know why she said that. Uh, and then we cut away there to, uh, again, this Grand Serpent guy in the 80s. We get a short scene where we see a unit in the 80s where this big chubby guy is talking with uh, this Benedict Cumberbatch lookalike where he's saying that, uh, well, the Grand Serpent wants to be in charge of unit and this guy is saying, fuck no, I don't trust you at all. And then he gets killed by the end of the scene. Where's the Brigadier? See, this doesn't make any sense. This guy's not the Brigadier. Why is he here? You know, not that I wanted to see the Brigadier or, you know, a Brigadier lookalike or a CG, God forbid, you know, Nicholas Courtney in the episode. It is weird that there's not even really a name drop of the Brigadier in this. There's allusion to him later when we see Kate, but in the past, especially when, you know, Nicholas Courtney, Nicholas Courtney, uh, the Brigadier is an active member of Unit. Uh, we, we don't hear about him at all. Very... I guess it's kind of a missed opportunity, but it just kind of felt weird, you know, that we're seeing Unit in the past, but, you know, we don't see the Brigadier. He's the face of Unit. But yeah, this big chubby guy dies. Grand Serpent is taking more victims. You know, he still remains in the roots of Unit. Again, don't know who he is, where he's from, why this matters. I'm assuming maybe he's related to Division in some way. I'm assuming we're going to get the answers in, you know, the finale. I started taking some sparse notes around this time, but I'm pretty sure it's here that we cut to Yaz, Dan, and Jericho on their mysterious fucking Mickey Mouse boat, where we see Liverpool Man. <gasps> Liverpool Man! What? A ship. A ship at sea. I'll call a steward. Wait, I know you. What? Yeah, why do they have a ship? Joseph Williamson. The man we have a name. Joseph no, Williamson. Joseph Williams. Please explain. The Williamson Tunnels, the a tourist thing, they're being excavated in my time. If he keeps turning up in all these different places and times, we've got to find him. That's no. No. This man tunnels through time? That makes... What? It's a cute idea, but if we set up Liverpool Man... All the way back, literally the first scene of Doctor Who Flux, just so they could use his tunnels to get back to normal time. It is, it's the biggest fucking plot contrivance in the history of Chibnall's run. I'm pretty sure I understand what they're doing with Liverpool Man. And it is the single biggest contradiction and contrivance in, I know it's a buzzword that I use in these reviews, but it really is by definition, a contrivance, where Liverpool Man has existed, he's been in one scene, he's barely been established in Flux up until this point. It is established that how Dan, Yaz, and Jericho are going to get out of the 1900s is that he, through some miraculous fucking coincidence, just tunnels through time. Liverpool Man just has the ability to tunnel through time. He's appeared at the Temple of Atropos. He's appeared in, you know, his time of 1904 Liverpool. He's appeared in modern-day Liverpool with Dan. 
He's appeared all over the place. It turns out that is, you know, he's been around because he has the miraculous capability to have tunnels that go through time. I am so afraid. I have a terrible feeling that this is not going to be explained in episode 6. He just exists to get them out of the 1900s. It feels as though he was writing all this, you know, he got to episode 4, he realized, Chris realized that he got, you know, the companions stuck in the 1900s, and he realized, how the hell am I going to get them out of the 1900s? And then he invented Liverpool Man, and strung him through the rest of his scripts, just kind of worked him into the stories, and then had him, you know, exist just to get them back to the present day. So we see him, we get some more scenes of, you know, this whole, we're going to get back to the present day through his time tunnels. Uh, so we cut to 1904 Liverpool, which is was the opening shot of Flux, all the way back in episode one, where we see, uh, you know, Yaz, Den, and Jericho going into the tunnels, encountering Liverpool Man, where they kind of create an alliance and move forward from there. God damn it. Like, I understand it's a cool idea. You use the tunnels, they go through time, it's cool, it's sci-fi. Doctor Who has done stuff like that. But he exists only for this reason. This fucking guy. Makes no sense. Also, this is two scenes for Liverpool Man. Finally, two scenes. I've been at my wit's end. Finally. I've been in one scene in every episode. So much to show you. Finally, I'm important so to the plot. Time. We cut back to the Doctor and Tech Taeyun, where we continue this dialogue focusing around the fob watch. Tech Taeyun, for some reason, tries to create an alliance with the Doctor, saying that, oh, you have a choice. You can choose the fob watch and your memories, or to join me. The memories you took from me. Oh, no. The number. Zero. Thousands. Plot is saved. Defend it from its inevitable destruction and fail. Or rejoin division. Rejoin me. Come I wonder which one she's gonna choose. Obviously, she was never gonna join Tech Tayun. As a moment, it makes almost no sense. Uh, the doctor does call it out. She says, I would never in a million years join you. And it's stupid of you to think that. So I, I guess kudos to Chris for realizing that it's... A choice that's made before it even gets pitched but it's a choice that is made before it gets pitched it is pointless and then we're finally following modern day unit and we see kate stewart return to doctor who it's corner your corner for a while Ooh, kate uh we see the grand serpent again doing his classic slimy tricks he's gonna uh, try to kill kate here or you know get in some sort of power position at unit uh, Kate naturally just looks him right in the eyes and realizes, and calls him out, and says that she knows that he is an alien, and uh, you know she calls his bluff and you know makes him piss his pants. Naturally, Kate is a badass, and we love her. Nevertheless, Eunice better not kill Kate. Wound down forthwith. Better not fucking kill Kate, Chris Chibnall. I see you. I'm gonna be so pissed. I see you. Oh. Whatever you are. Ooh. Hiding in plain sight for so I dug deep. Yeah. Past the tampered archives and doctored photographs. And then we get this line. I am the head of unit. And if you don't stop this, I will expose you. <laughs> expose you. you. Terrible word. Really don't want to argue. Come on, Chris. Expose, expose you. Bandage. I will expose you as a threat. Had me laughing for way too long. Such a weird line. And uh, the actresses, for, the Kate Stewart's actress delivered it so, I mean, it was funny. You know, it is a funny line. I don't think I was supposed to get as much of a kick out of it as I did, but I did. It was so funny to me that she l genuinely threatened him with saying, I will expose you. I blame, I blame our generation and, you know, the mainstreaming of these terms because it's so funny. Anyway. I oh, know this is when Bell and Dogman face off, right? So we cut away to the Doctor and the Doctor Bell and Dogman facing off in their big ship. Yeah, I already talked about this. Basically, they just get in a big scuffle, 
and then they realize that they kind of have to work together. So the episode is winding to its cliffhanger now. Um, we have all these plot points following. Uh, we see Liverpool Man, Yaz, Dan, and Jericho in this whole MacGuffin room with all these doors leading to past, present, and future. Uh, we see that uh, one of the doors is knocking, which had not happened up until that point. Uh, so it's a big scary moment. We see the Grand Serpent at Kate's desk where he's saying to us on Tarn over the phone that they're going to wage war on the planet or something. So basically the Santarans are invading right now. That is who is knocking through the door. So the Santaran, I'm pretty sure, I might be misremembering, so forgive me if I am. The Santaran busts through the door and we have a big, you know, they shoot the Jer at Jericho and everyone. And then we cut away. Uh, what do we have? After this, we see, uh, I think we see Kate again where she's going to her front door. And then there's a bomb attached to it. She dodges it and says to uh, Osgood over the phone that she has to go dark. We cut away. We do see her in the next time trailer, so Kate is going to return in the next episode. Uh, so there's still more there that we're uh, going to see. Um, and then we see the Doctor and Tech Taeyun back in this little face-off over the fob watch. And then we see Swarm and Azura teleport into the scene, uh, kill Tech Taeyun, and basically just kind of say that they're bad guys. And uh, that's our cliffhanger. No, Doctor. You. What? Swarm kills Tech Taeyun. We get a big, you know, disintegrating moment where her face melts away. Uh, she dies. And then Swarm turns to the Doctor and says, And now, Doctor, you. Bjorn. And that's the cliffhanger. So, for Survivors of the Flux, this feels the most like it's building to something awesome. Um, I think it's really a mixed bag in terms of elements that are good and bad. I think the division as a concept is good. Tech Taeyun in the story, whatever, I don't really care. I think um, it's just really baking on the fact that the division is a cool idea, I guess. I don't really care about the Doctor's memories at all. You know, it's 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 nothing to me. We already established in both Revolution of the Daleks and the Timeless Child that we shouldn't care about the memories. It doesn't matter. Yet we're getting teased with the fact that we're getting the memories. Honestly, if the Doctor does end up getting her memories at the end, I think it'll be a complete murder of uh, Doctor Who Flux's themes. The fact that she doesn't need the memories to be complete. The fact, the way that they're building up to this, and especially knowing how Chris Chibnall has handled Doctor Who in the past, I think it's going to end with her getting her memories, which I feel is a thematic contradiction in the most fundamental way, based on what has happened past in, in, in you know Chris Chibnall's run in series eleven and twelve, and the uh, New Year special Revolution of the Daleks, where we establish that you don't need the memories to not understand who you are. You are who you define yourself to be. This one felt more like setup than even, you know, Halloween Apocalypse, which was critically, you know, targeted for being only setup based. But I think with this one, we're deep enough into the plot. We have these seeds being planted. Seeing the payoff here is nice, I guess. But in general, uh, I think what sinks this one for me is you know, the contradiction that built this one, the fact that, you know, the TARDIS team are just kind of frolicking around 1904, no explanation as to why, no roots in any of that story, no logic in why we're following it, or how we're following it, or the progression of time as it is for them. We're just kind of jumping around and seeing them in different, you know, continents. As fun of a character as Liverpool Man is, I think... The fact that he only exists to serve this function is very, you know, upsetting. I was really hoping he was going to factor in in a better way. Didn't end up really being that. I think characterization in general is better. I think Jericho is a stronger character. I think seeing the characters independent is a nice thing to see. But, you know, I need to know why that happened plot-wise. Which is the last thing I expected to have in Flux. I expect the, the plot to be, you know, at least I can follow that, but the characterization is what is usually inconsistent. But here, it's the complete inverse. The characterization is fine, but the plot is a mess. So, you know, you can never have it one way in a Chris Chibnall story. I think, I mean, I mean there's enough here. I don't think it's, it, this feels more like kind of a two-parter. I have a feeling 
this is the most linked to its sequel than any other episode in Flux so far. And I kind of feel it's unfair to rank it on its own. Uh, just note that Division stuff was cool, I guess. Uh, I have ideas going forward. I think with the Vanquishers, it's going to be what make or break this entire series of Flux, basically. If it ends strong, it would have been okay, I guess, with you know, a few a few low points. If it doesn't, then none of this was building to anything worthwhile at all, and it was just kind of a terrible series. But, uh, you know, we'll find out next week, because I'll be reviewing the season finale of Doctor Who Flux, The Vanquishers, when it airs, you know, I'm gonna do it as I did this time, go through every single thing, talk about what I liked, what I didn't like, and, I guess, a conclusive review of Doctor Who Flux overall. Uh, I'm going to be reviewing Doctor Who Flux and the Chibnall era overall in my remastered video essay, as I've, you know, been alluding to over the past, you know, months of production on that. Uh, you know, I, 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 there's not much to say. There's not much to say with this one. It was a mixed bag. I think it's, that's the perfect way to say it. It was a mixed bag. It had elements that I could not follow, elements that I was following well enough, but the good elements could be ruined, potentially, if its follow-up is bad. But yeah, that's how I felt about it. So far in Doctor Who Flux, we had episode one, The Halloween Apocalypse, Misguided, episode two, War of the Sontarans, which I think was awful and just kind of indicative of, you know, I see it no different than some of the worst Chibnall has delivered in his run, like Arachnids in the UK, all these other episodes with just a mountain of contrivance and contradiction piling up over a plot that is unremarkable. Once Upon Time, which I think was gimmicky and had terrible setup, but ultimately ended with strong characterization and good dialogue. Village of the Angels, so far the strongest of Flux. Uh, a realistic depiction of the Weeping Angels. Some really strong characters. Some really strong co-writing that was absolutely the contribution of the co-writer Maxine Alderton. Some genuinely tense moments, some cool imagery, some fun scenes, with a few elements that dragged it down a little bit for me. And finally, Survivors of the Flux. The first of the two parts of the finale, in my opinion. And I think it's a fine enough setup. Mixed bag, to be sure. But anyways, I'm gonna go. It's been a pleasure. It's been a joy. Next week, I'll be back with the Vanquishers, the season finale. That's a big one. Uh, don't be alarmed if you have to wait a while for it. I just need to make sure. Like, I can't remake these videos. That's something that I'm understanding now. The things that I say are set in stone, you know, and, and seeing that I, there are a ton of people, you know, caring about my, it's very strange, you know, having this dedicated following of people watching my reviews, it's nuts. Anyway, thank you so much for what, I have to say that, like, thank you so much. The support is, it means everything. I, I'm so happy. You guys even remotely care about my opinions enough to click on the video. I hope, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm a worthy enough reviewer to, you know, dedicate your entire hour or whatever it is to hearing my rambling you know i i try as much as i can to give these ones a fair shake i don't love the chibnall era i want a good series out of it so we'll see if flux delivers in the end i can't say it enough it's so kind of you thank you anyway i'm done thank you for watching it's been a joy i hope i've been fair to survivors of the flux i think i was it, it's pretty much now i feel about it i see you no know, you know contradiction in terms of this review Hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you thought about it. You can contact me and just write it in the I don't know. I'm going to go now. It's been a pleasure. I never know how to end these videos. I've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes. I need to leave. Goodbye. I'm leaving now. Bye. Thank you for watching, though. Goodbye.